Astrophotography is all about capturing the beauty of the night sky. And while it's easy to focus on the equipment and the techniques we use, choosing the right location is even more important. As many of you know, I take most of my pictures here in the backyard in the city, and this really limits my image quality and there are certain projects that I just can't do from here. So how do you find the best places to take your astro photos when you don't have the benefit of living in a dark sky location? In this video, I'll explain everything you need to know to choose the best dark sky spot for your next astro photography project. The unfortunate truth is light pollution severely impacts your astro photography. It washes out the faint objects in the night sky like galaxies and nebulae, and even the stars themselves. When it comes to taking great pictures of the night sky, dark skies make all the difference. From a dark sky location, your images will have better clarity and contrast. The faint details of your subject that are normally washed out by the perpetual glare of the city are now visible. Your images will be a lot cleaner and a lot more enjoyable to process. You'll have less gradients and weird color casts to remove, and your signal to noise ratio will be better. If you're doing nightscapes or Milky Way photography, a dark sky location is an absolute must. It's also just a better experience overall to be at a dark sky location, to see the night sky above your head and pick out individual deep sky objects with your naked eye. It's an amazing feeling. The good news is there are some great tools to help you find your next dark sky location for Astro. The Light Pollution Map is a free interactive online tool that you can use to find dark sky locations by showing how much artificial light is in a particular area. When you open the map, you'll see a world map overlaid with color gradients representing light pollution levels. These colors correlate with the zenith sky brightness, ranking night sky brightness from heavily light polluted to pristine conditions. This also correlates with the Bortle scale, which uses these values to assign a number from one, a pristine dark sky, to nine, an inner city urban sky. After I look at the light pollution map to find a dark sky area, I look for rental properties that land in these dark sky pockets. Ash and I have had great luck renting Airbnb and Verbo listings. If it mentions anything about stargazing in the listing, that's a really good sign. That's pretty rare, but it shows you that they understand how special the location is. You can inspect the property photos to make sure that there aren't any surprise neighbors with decorative lighting or spotlights that come on in the middle of the night to destroy the pristine skies. You can tell a lot from the photos, but I always send a message to the owner as well. I mentioned that I'll be driving hours to get there and that I'm coming for stargazing specifically and confirm that there are no big exterior lights that come on at night to erase the sky. You can also use the Google Maps satellite view to get a better feel for things like tree lines and vantage points where you'll be setting up your scope. I also ask if it's okay if I can set up my telescope and leave it running throughout the night, especially if they live on the property, and I also ask if they have any exterior outlets that I can plug into. Usually the hosts are really cool and love the fact that I'm stargazing on their property. I always send them the picture that I take when I get home and it usually ends up in the listing. <laughs> Absolutely love the planning process for these trips and I've booked some absolute bangers in the past. I've stayed in bunkies, upstairs spare bedrooms, sheds, couches, it's an adventure. You can also use the light pollution map to find dark sky spots for camping. National parks, state parks, and off-grid campsites are perfect for astronomy. Here in Ontario, we usually stick to the provincial parks rather than the off-grid sites, so we can plug in our camper and fill up with water and all that fun stuff. We try to use the campgrounds that are as far away from the city centers as possible. Staying at busier campgrounds means that you might have a neighbor that has lights set up at night on their campsite that couldn't care less about looking up at the night sky. This is localized light pollution, which can be really frustrating if you've driven a long way to get there. When approaching our neighbors about turning down their lights or at least pointing them away from us, it's always best to do it with kindness. You'll get much farther that way. Once you've explained how far you've driven and why you're there, they're usually pretty understanding about the light pollution. They just don't even think about it. You can always leave your campsite and go find a dark sky spot on the campground, but make sure you wear your red headlamp and don't leave your gear running on its own out there. 
Dark Sky International designates specific places worldwide to protect unspoiled dark skies. These include dark sky parks, communities, reserves, and sanctuaries. These are some of the best places for stargazing and astrophotography in the world. However, because these are large protected spaces and they're scattered everywhere, you might not be very close to any of them. Our favorite one that's closest to us is Cherry Spring State Park in Pennsylvania, about a three and a half, four hour drive from home. You can use Dark Sky International's online tool to find out where the closest designated dark sky spot is to you. Now this part is very important. Always plan your dark sky trips surrounding the nights of the new moon. There is no point in traveling to a Bortle One location to shoot under a bright moonlit sky. Those new moon weekends are precious, so maybe block those off in your calendar ASAP. The time of year is really important too, especially if you want to capture the Milky Way. The galactic core is the brightest part of our galaxy and can be seen with your naked eye from a truly dark sky spot. You can use an astronomy app like Stellarium to see exactly where and when the Milky Way core will rise, or you can get really specific and use an app like PhotoPills to get the perfect nightscape shot. In general, in the Northern Hemisphere, Milky Way season is from May to September, so make those clear nights count. To take full advantage of a truly dark sky, don't use any filters with your camera. While light pollution filters are very handy in the city, they reduce the amount of starlight and natural color your camera collects. This is especially important when you capture faint broadband targets like reflection nebulae and dark nebulae. These objects are very difficult to capture under a bright city sky, so make sure you go after them when you're on a dark sky excursion. Even if you decide to photograph a bright nebula under dark skies, you'll have the benefit of revealing the faint details surrounding it including the natural star colors. So leave those narrow band filters at home and focus on collecting that precious broadband data when you're at a dark sky site. I recommend using a simpler setup when you're off the beaten path. You need to think about powering your gear and lugging it to a secluded spot. For this reason, I usually use a DSLR or mirrorless camera in these situations and use an intervalometer to run the session. It's a little less automated, but it feels like it's just the right amount of involvement for trips like this. A camera lens is a great choice when visiting these spots and you can take some amazing starry sky photos that just aren't obtainable from the city. Even if I'm bringing my full-blown telescope set up to these spots, I usually run a little Milky Way portable star tracker rig alongside it. One thing to keep in mind, and this is easy to forget, make sure that you are totally polar aligned and ready to go before it gets completely dark out. That hour between dusk and astronomical darkness is crunch time. Once it's completely dark out, it can be hard to spot Polaris amongst a sea of stars from a truly dark sky. As for telescopes, I think your time is best spent using something with a mid-range focal length. Rather than going for a long focal length of 2,000 millimeters or more, go for a wider field of view in the 250 to 500 millimeter range. This will showcase a more diverse field of stars and uncover interesting areas of dark dust, nebulosity, and clusters of stars. There are more options at this focal length for pairings and interesting framing of regions of the sky. Use common sense when going on these adventures. Don't set up your gear anywhere that's dangerous to navigate at night. Scout out your location during the daytime and remember that you'll eventually have to pack up and get out of there in the dark. Depending on where you're set up, it can get pretty freaky. You'll hear noises in the distance, rustling in the trees, breathing, snorting animals. If full panic sets in, it's like, screw the shot, I'm out of here. Wear a headlamp that has a red beam and a bright white mode. That white light is your best defense against a surprise visitor, like a raccoon. The bottom line is make sure that you're comfortable and that you're in a safe spot, not too far from your car, your campsite, or the footpath. I hope that this video has inspired you to get out to a dark sky spot this summer and have your own adventure. The next time you're sitting on a rock under the Milky Way, taking one minute subs on your star tracker, just know that there's a good chance that I'm out there too, doing the exact same thing and enjoying every second of it. Until next time, clear skies.